Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan, and my special guest is Kathy Leggett. She is a, um, a family mediator. She also has mediation and, cons and counseling consultants business. Uh, what I really like about uh, what she brings is she's telling people there is another way of getting divorced and going through custody situations other than just going through this litigative, ugly, toxic process of getting divorced. So well, welcome, Kathy. Thanks, Danica. I appreciate it. So we, when we were off the air, we were talking about a lot of different things. I was saying, well, what is it that, that you really want our viewers to know about what you do and how is it going to make things better for, for a, you know, parents that are going through custody situations, possibly high custody situations, because that's the majority of our, our audience here. Right. Well, <clears throat> I'll just fill you in and give you a little bit of background. Um, so in just to get us up to, you know, to par here about how I got into mediation. Um, so golly, I'm going to tell my age. It was 1984-ish, I think, was the first time I uh, got a job at a law firm. <clears throat> and um, then I progressed into working in family law with some very, a couple of very um, aggressive litigators you know, attorneys and family law. And most of the time I was on the phone, you know, with the client kind of just listening and, and, and trying to be supportive and things would just be terrible going on for years and years and years. Um, I, I was, I took the LSATs. So I was going to go to law school, but decided to deviate from that. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, and then when I realized that I could go into the field of mediation, which began again in the late eighties, um, <clears throat> I thought, wow, that's just, that's a perfect fit. I can stay in the field of law and I don't have to wound anybody. I don't have to be the bad guy. I don't have to, you know, go into battle. I can, I can be there and help people resolve their issues um, and work together and, you know, move on with their lives. So <clears throat> as I started to really look into this alternative um, process that, that I, I do, there's traditional mediation where once you're in litigation with the courts, um, you're, you're going to be ordered to go to mediation. The court wants people to work out their own issues, especially in family law, because nobody really knows the best solution um, in any case than the parties. I mean, you know, I don't want somebody determining or, or ruling on how much time I should have with my kids or or what assets I should have and liabilities and I should be responsible for. I mean, it's our stuff. It's our future. It's our life. And we should be able to have control over how that's going to play out for us in the future. Now, it wasn't always mandated. At what point was mediation kind of like the go-to for every uh, court Mm -hmm. uh, areas of area of court. Now, um, at what point did it become a mandatory uh, thing for uh, family law? Pretty sure it was in like the 90s, the mid 90s. Um, they decided, <clears throat> okay, if there's, if, if it reaches a certain point, and there's no progress, everything's going to be mandated to go to mediation first. Um, so in my mind, because uh, for years I did all of the paperwork, the pleadings, um, by the way, the attorneys don't do those, the paralegals do those, so <laughs> for the most part, <laughs> they do all the work. 
um, <clears throat> I thought, wow, you know, what if even prior to filing for divorce, you know, we're, we're kind of backing up a little bit. All right, people know, hey, we're gonna go get a divorce. Typically, one person retains an attorney, they file, they serve the other person, the other person retains an attorney, and then it it's on. Um, sometimes they come to an agreement, sometimes they don't. But I thought, what if prior to even filing, everybody gets together, we talk, we make decisions about assets and liabilities, time sharing with the kids, all those things, put it into an agreement, then file an uncontested divorce. You get your final hearing in six to eight weeks after you file. All of the necessary pleadings are done, taken care of for you, and boom, you know, it's, it's taken care of. Absolutely. Hey, if you hear any knocking, we are, because of quarantine, we're, we're working from home. Right. So, <laughs> and I have dogs, so my dogs, <laughs> if the wind blows, my dogs might bark, so. Oh my gosh. So we'll just deal with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I didn't yeah, hear anything, by the was, way. What's that? I didn't hear anything. So. Okay, good. Well, that's because I had, had, had my, myself on mute. Okay. You will. Well, and also, so, so again, getting to your question, your initial question, this is an alternative. I like to say I'm an attorney alternative, um, where for less than the retainer of one attorney, you can come in, get your case mediated, sit down together, leave with an agreement, a parenting plan, get all your pleadings filed and get your notice of final hearing in the mail and it's done yeah um, and you know i can see how that could totally avoid uh going into that storm that high conflict nasty storm um that happens that's predictable when you bring this heavy litigator on your on your team. However, what I I know what our viewers are probably thinking is, what if I'm dealing with a big bully? If I have, if I know this is going to be nasty, um, I need to get an attorney. Mm -hmm. So how how is your practice able to take that situation where it's a high conflict situation? and help this person navigate it. Maybe they don't have $100,000 to, to spend to, to fight for just for their own rights. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> attorneys, of course, they're, they're trained to litigate. That's why they go to law school. They're trained to fight and, and advocate for their client. And, and if you need an attorney to do that, um, you should have an attorney to do that. However, they are also, in, in divorce, it's very emotional. It's probably one of the most difficult events that people experience in their life, other than death or, well, that's the only other, other thing. Um, I'm a, a trained, licensed mental health clinician here in the state of Florida. So uh, I also have a um, practice where I do psychotherapy and, and I continue with continuing education on, on that. And, and so as a mediator, <clears throat> I'm able to look at people's emotional states. I'm able to stop when people need to take a break. We're, we address some of those things. Whereas when you're in court and you're dealing with attorneys, they're just not trained um, to handle a lot of that, which many times when they get someone who is difficult to work with, whether it's their client or the client on the other side, they call me for other services like parent coordination <laughs> um, in order to deal with that. So. That's an additional bonus of having someone who can recognize um, those behaviors 
and address them appropriately. So would you find yourself, okay, so when a person comes in because they really want to have like a, a, they don't want it to get contentious and, and lots of drama and stuff like that. They really are wanting to find, to have a peaceful, peaceful resolution. And then something happens. <laughs> um, were, are you able to, was it mis a mistake for them to go to you first or to go straight to that litigator? Or is it something where you, it would, because they came into your door, you can actually help navigate them to something that's maybe a, a step up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the majority of the time we work through it. Um, uh, but people call all the time and they say, well, there's, there are these particular issues that we're having problems with. And cause they get the idea that they have to come in. They can only come in if they already have everything agreed to. And it's like, well, that's not really the case. You know, that's my job is to help you uh, resolve the things that you can't work through on your own. Um, but yeah, there are, there are always unexpected things that come up. Um, and then we just, we work through it. I'll, I can tell you that in 15 years of doing this type of mediation, which I call pre-suit mediation. Um, there have probably only been five couples that either did not come to an agreement or came to an agreement and then changed their mind. And out of those ones that changed their mind, I've had a couple come back to me and say, you know what? We ended up with just about exactly the same thing as we had in mediation two years ago. And I spent $30,000 and um, I wish I would have just, you know, filed the agreement. Wow. Yeah. I really like what you're creating and putting out there. I think it's something that you, that really needs to get, needs to be heard because yeah. it's like you, you have that mental health component and you're able to bring the compassion because that's what I've noticed in even when people are just, they just have an attorney, an attorney is not typically not trained to help them prepare for a mediation, help them pre to pre prepare for a hearing, like emotionally and mentally prepare for that. They kind of lean on their, you know, their paralegal staff to kind of bring the, the feminine touch to the, right. to the situation. And um, it sounds to me like, you have that, like even if a person is not even quite sure that they're ready for a divorce, but they need to kind of lay things out, um, you're that place, that safe space that says, that lays things out for them um, so that they can even decide if they want to stay together or not. Right. Um, and a lot of times people will, <clears throat> I shouldn't say a lot of times, but there have been several times people have come to an agreement and then we've just held off filing the case and they have reconciled there was not it wasn't necessary to do that and then another advantage that i love is being able to support this is kind of where we we get intertwined is um with the children so divorce in and of itself is not damaging to children. It's the conflict that's damaging to the children. And things that I've seen over the years from working in family law um, is conflict builds and builds and builds. Now, and I'm not even going to go down that road, but um, <laughs> I'm glad you said, I'm glad you said divorce is not what damages the children right. it's the conflict it's and the, the, yes because people to you know people who are very unhappy and they are de determined to stay together because they said they would that now this child is living in this toxic environment where their parents are intact but um it's almost like i really get that 
it's better to have two parents living in two different homes that are happy and co-parenting happily together. Mm -hmm. uh, that's better for the child than for the child to live within the, in the pressure cooker of an intact family. Right. And what this mediation process also offers to the children is the parents are already starting to set an example of, hey, we're working together. We love you. We're working on a parenting plan that's going to work well for both of us and for the kids. And, and the children can see, not that they know they're going to mediation or whatever, but they're not um, affected by hearing conversations of, well, his attorney said this and her attorney sent me this. And can you believe that, you know, and just they oh, kids know. Kids overhear a lot. They observe everything. And they, they feel the tension that their parents feel. Um, so rather than starting below ground zero, because trust has been violated and, and diminished, and they can't even breathe the same air in the same room anymore, um, I've seen where it's not been so bad and then after a year and a half of litigation, they just can't stand the sight of each other. Yeah. Um, and what that does to the ability to co-parent well, I can't even describe. So in mediation where we don't have that, we're building trust, we're working together, we're talking about the kids. It's not just, oh, here's model one for your parenting plan, good luck like what you would get in the courts, because nobody can, I call them a recipe for disaster. They have, you will return the child at this time and that time, but you know, there are a lot of things that people want to have some flexibility with. I had the benefit of working with great people who maybe their marriage isn't working anymore, but they still want to co-parent well. That's typically the client that I get. I want to co-parent well, and I want to, be there for my children. Um, that's first and foremost. And so we can, we tailor design parenting plans for the parents and the children for their, for their benefit. And, and we make it workable where they can actually do what the parenting plan says. And then I tell parents, okay, the court requires we have this parenting plan and we put something in place. But here's the most important thing. You are the parents. You can take this parenting plan, stick it in the drawer, and never look at it again. I really don't care. As long as the two of you agree, you can do whatever you want to do. It's just, you know, it's there as a default. In the event you guys can't agree, oh, let's pull out the parenting plan that we both worked on and agreed to and see what it says. Oh, yeah, you do get Thanksgiving this year. But it, it, it allows parents some flexibility if they want to have flexibility and it's not so rigid. And that's what kids need. Kids need to know, well, can I stay at dad's a couple other nights, you know, because we're having fun or whatever. I mean, and that's what I stress anyway, is like, be as flexible as you can possibly be. Your kids love both of you they need both of you and they need to have the freedom to love both of you and be with both of you i would say this is definitely a preemptive uh thing that parents should, should definitely go into um thinking because i can see how uh, attorneys can just really stoke the fire um you know that and you know demand every asset of the, from the marriage and then the person is who is reacting to that as if well, it came from to, their other parent. Yeah, and to explain that in legal terms, I'm not, I'm not giving legal advice, but I, I do know because I had to work in that, is when you file a petition for divorce, if you don't ask for everything in that petition, you can't go back and go, oh yeah, well, now I want, this account and this car and all of that. So that's when people are so shocked when they get served with a petition and it asks for the sun, the moon, and the stars. 
And all of a sudden, emotions kick in, they get defensive, they hire another bulldog attorney, and then the fight is on because they feel like they're being attacked and everything's gonna be stripped and taken from them. They want the kids, full custody of the kids, they want the house, they want both cars, they want, you see what I'm saying? It's like, it's like they're fighting over, okay, so like going in and haggling for a car, for the price of a car. You've got the, the, the salesman that's, that's jacking it up 15 grand and you know, and then you, you know, it's like, oh, there's this assumption for negotiation and that's fine for a car that there's no emotional attachment to. But when you're talking about, you know, things that mean something for these parents, asking for your portion and their portion too, doesn't work. No, there's so much loss associated in divorce. I mean, nobody gets married thinking, well, you know, I'll I'll give this six years and, you know, then we'll cut ties and, and move on. I mean, you just don't do that. So there's that personal component to it. And then you have emotional attachment to this life that you've built. And I have not figured out yet how to take one household with two incomes and split that to where there's no financial loss. You know, there's financial loss for both parties. And what we do, at least in my office, is try to minimize loss for both parties. Like, how can we, how can we minimize loss here? It's gonna happen, but, and you can rebuild, but let's minimize that. So, um, and <laughs> I had a, um, a surgeon from Lakeland and his wife. Typically we do it. I try to prep everybody well enough to where we get everything done in the first three hour session because I book a three hour mediation session. And I would say 98% of them are done in that time. But this was a physician. There were at, there was alimony issues. They had children in college and all that. He said, I went to an attorney um, for a consultation and they wanted a $50,000 retainer just to get started. Wow. And he said, I would rather have that to go to my daughter's education than, you know, fight. I mean, it, it took us, we worked together for about six months, but it was um, nowhere near $50,000. And you know, wow. that's just, again, that's the attorney mindset because they're thinking discovery, they're going to go through all the financials, there's mm -hmm. going to be um, litigation back and forth with regard to the amount of alimony, and there were, I think, three homes, and so, but we got it taken care of um, for a fraction of that. For a fraction. Absolutely. And, and, and I, that, that money goes to their children, you know, mm -hmm. and that's with everybody. It's like, why do you want to spend between the two of you depleting assets that you've built to give? The attorneys are only ones that win most of the time. Nobody wins in divorce, but the attorneys. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to go that way. Okay. And I'm sure that if they went your, um, they went to you to come up with peaceful resolution. Um, is it sometimes one parent or do they come together uh, as co-parents and ask you to sort to, to work this out? Um, Typically one person will contact me at first and I always ask for the contact information of the other party um, if they've discussed it um, so that I can send that informational packet out to both. But sometimes they haven't yet. They're just calling to kind of get it to feel out what the process is and who am I and what's this going to be like. And then they mention it to the other person um, and they let me know and I reach out to that person by sending the packet. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm in neutral. I'm not here. It doesn't matter to me who calls first or if one party's 
paying for the whole thing. It's I'm here as a neutral third party to help resolve the issues that and address everything that the court's going to require so that they can seamlessly go through this process um, and move on with their lives. This sounds like like the perfect, perfect alternative because the thing is, is a lot of times, uh, I mean, there's, there's no guarantees when you get, even if you interview attorneys, uh, a lot of times it's who has the best sales pitch. Right. And then you really don't know how your attorney is going to be until you, you spent the money and you know, you spend some time with them mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know, man, that's like, that's a gamble. And um, some people say, you know, it depends on what the judge had for breakfast or is it time for lunch and how are they going to rule? I mean, yeah, so many factors that go in and it's unpredictable, at least in mediation, you know what you have and you yeah. have control. You can say, I mean, you're not forced to come into an agreement, but most of the time people would rather say at least i know i have this and cut their losses and take it from there so are you the are you a, a unicorn in the in the field or i are am there... a unicorn in the field i have been for a while <laughs> and it's amazing i mean it's it's hard to get that message out there i've had people come in for we i do I also do modifications. So people who are already divorced, even some of the people that I've worked with and they've come back and said, we want to change up some stuff and they come back and because parenting, you know, kids grow up or they become teenagers. I, it, it's funny because when the kids are young, everybody wants the kids. I want my baby, you know, they're so cute. Right. And then they get to be teenagers. I always tell them, all right, in about eight years, you're going to be going, please come get this child. I know, right? <laughs> you know, think about it, you know. <laughs> How about parents that start out and they're like, okay, you get first half of Thanksgiving Day, and then we're going to, you know, so in that noon, you're going to swap them over and, and stuff. And, or, you know, you have so many different arrangements when they're small um, that work when they're small. Right. Uh, but when you get older and it, it's like fitting, cramming a child, an eight year old child in a little toddler outfit, it doesn't fit. <laughs> right. right. Um, yeah. yeah. That's something to think about. And I would say that for sure with your practice, you're able to give them a little bit of like heads up. Have you considered this? Maybe there's, this needs to be kind of a living, uh, breathing document that gets gets uh, revisited every few years. Yeah, yeah, we definitely do that. And what's great is I've had the privilege of working with hundreds of couples, and I tell them that I tell everybody I'm not here to craft this agreement for you or tell you what you should do, but I can give you input or I can make suggestions because it is an emotional time, and people come in, and sometimes you get really polarized in your thinking because our our hippocampus shuts it when we're when we're in fight or flight right it's like certain things in our body shut down for our survival and have you ever been in a situation where you've been really nervous and you've left and you go oh, i should have said this or i should have done that because we're not really thinking um optimally so I'm also there to say, well, hey, maybe you, have you ever thought about this? Or I had a couple with a similar situation and they decided this, would this work for you guys? Um, so I can, I can bring out other options that maybe they're not able to really formulate for themselves during that emotional time. Absolutely. As, you know, during this, this whole kind of lockdown, everybody being, uh, stuck at home and there there's no work to be done and stuff like that there's that has been a real like an eye-opener about people's emotions and their knee-jerk reaction to things now 
after a couple months, people are starting to, to be a little bit calmer and they're realizing, oh, maybe that was reactionary. But um, yeah, they just, it, you know it better than anything um, in, with your background, the predictability of reactions. Um, reactions to pandemics, reactions to divorce, just the emotions take over. I don't know if you've ever personally been in court or not, but it's pretty frightening and intimidating. And so correlating that with the COVID fear, you know, people, people just act differently when they're afraid uh, and, and when fear is a factor. So you go into a courtroom and it's fear, you know, it's fear-based. It's kind of intimidating sometimes going in an attorney's office or getting your deposition taken. Oh, I hate that. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I have never had anybody um, say to me, gosh, you know, I remember when this court case was going on and I was getting these subpoenas and I had to get my deposition taken and all these cruel letters from this attorney. I just, Gosh, I just missed that, you know? I really wish I hadn't settled that case because I really liked litigation. Oh. <laughs> it's it's horrible. It is it is horrible. It's, it's absolutely horrific and painful and there's value in in settling and putting it behind you. You know, when you're in the middle of litigation, that's all there is. It's like it just consumes your life. Yes. It's terrible. I agree. Well, our time is up. I really appreciate you taking some time, Kathy, to to share with us about Thanks what, for asking. I yeah. Really, yeah. Because I, I really, for the viewers, even though most of our viewers are in a high conflict custody battle situation, um, they're also looking for answers. They're looking for something that if they if they they don't have the money for an attorney, they don't want to feel so unprotected that they just use like a like a paralegal service or something like right. that because they still feel like they're on their own. Sure. But um, I would see I I can see how you're you're able to actually still hold their hand and take more um, and and help them to guide them through um, the next chapter in their lives. Yeah. Well, All right. Thanks, Danica, and thanks for everything that you do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, that's all we have for Custody Matters Live. You have a great evening and we will see you again next week.